Thank you very much for uh, being here again. Uh, I will present Alberto Naldoni, a uh, uh, PhD in Chemical Science, University of Milan. Uh, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Italian National Research Council in Milan, Italy. Italy. And since uh, 2014, he's visiting scientists in the Nanofotonics Group in the Big Nanotechnology Center of Purdue uh, in the United States. And now uh, he's uh, recently joined RCP team as co leader of the photochemistry field cells division there in, 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 in Czech Republic. And now he's, uh, he will give us an, uh, the first lecture of plasma induced for current generation. And uh, the auditor is all yours. Uh, you have the time. And Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, we can give us a so, yeah. so, good morning to everybody. As we heard in my mention today, I start to talk about uh, the um, generation of hot carriers. So, okay, maybe this one. Uh, so, uh, basically, today I will cover a bit of uh, uh, fundamentals of uh, hot carrier generation and uh, some applications, specifically photo detection and catalysis. And while well, tomorrow I will talk more about the dissipation of surface plasmons in uh, to heat, and so the fields of thermoplasmonics uh, covering a, a bit of fundamentals and mostly showing uh, many different applications, uh, how can we use basically local heating uh, for future solar uh, thermal technology. So let's start, okay, this is the outline of, uh, of today. Uh, we start talking about the surface plasma dephasing and also introducing uh, just uh, uh, from a qualitative point of view some theoretical models which has been uh, reported to, um, to uh, show the, uh, how to calculate electron distri and energy distribution in uh, uh, plasmonic systems. Uh, and uh, um, after that I will talk about more uh, about uh, uh, hybrid semiconductor metal uh, system and how we can quantify the photocurrent <coughs> uh, that uh, uh, plasma induced hot carrier generation can produce in uh, uh, this kind of devices. Uh, after that also I will talk about more two uh, examples, let's say two type of uh, hot electron in, uh, injection in semiconductor uh, and then I will skip and I will go uh, to um, to talk about some application in photo detection, as I already said, uh, electrochemical water splitting, and also uh, auto electron driven catalysis at the metal surface. So let's start by uh, by the simple uh, simple slide, which shows uh, the temporal evolution of the phenomena which happens after the optical excitation in metal nanostructure. So uh, we have our um, plasmonic metal particles. We shine the light and we excite our plasma, so we are able to uh, <coughs> to concentrate light at the nanoscale. Uh, the uh, plasma, so the localized surface plasma resonance, decay uh, in a very short time, usually 1 to 10, 15 femtoseconds, and then uh, decay through Landau damping, uh, generating um, hot carriers, so hot electrons and holes, which form uh, Fermi Dirac distribution. So, as you can see here, after 100 femtoseconds, uh, we have already the formation of this uh, non-equilibrium uh, uh, energy <coughs> distribution of our hot carriers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, these carriers uh, mm -hmm. start to um, dissipate energy through scattering and so on. And so we have thermal dissipation into the lattice of our materials, so we can uh, really um, create significant temperature at the nanoscale. And, of course, this temperature then diffuses in all the materials. And so here also there is some... Uh, uh, some lecture which are very interesting if you want to take notes and go more in details about um, this uh, this topic. Just one quick question. Yes. This hot electrons is only one way of uh, dissipation of the decay mode. Is only of, uh, uh, one of the decay possible. Decay no, the actually, uh, as far as I know, there is two way. So this should be one way, uh, uh, and um, the other way. Uh, is more when you have a, uh, we have semiconductor molecules in contact with the uh, with the metals and uh, it is called uh, uh, interface damping. So basically, the uh, the electrons uh, of the plasmons um, 
I will talk a bit about later. Mm -hmm. Basically, dump uh, directly into the uh, unoccupied orbitals of the molecules of the semiconductor. So there is a creation of uh, instantaneous generation of different uh, charge separation states at the, at the interface. And there's been demonstration mm -hmm. about this. Um, this so you don't have radiation, also. Hmm? radiation of the chromatic waves. Uh, yes. What's the the order of temperature you can reach? Uh, it depends how much you pump the materials. And uh, uh, as I show in my lecture, uh, with solar uh, radiation, we um, illumination we achieve more than 600 degrees at 15 suns. But uh, um, you can reach much higher temperature depending on how much you pump. So uh, if you use a laser, of course, you have to, in comparison, you have to use, for example, 1 million times more power density to, to create similar temperature, 6-700 on a single on a structure. So uh, I will show later there was a uh, Brongesma group which uh, uh, with, a, with a laser basically uh, they uh, induced the ignition of aluminum on the structures because they create very strong gradient of temperature and reach in a, a very few seconds. And so this is also another interesting point. So we can create really very fast gradient of temperature which usually is not uh, is not achieved with, with other way of uh, hitting the, the non-structure itself. OK, this is uh, indeed uh, the what's happened when the plasmon uh, defaced. So uh, basically, uh, when our, uh, our, uh, uh, our waves, uh, light waves, are bound with the our uh, collective oscillation of electrons, and somehow at some point they start to deface, and so we have the uh, uh, the we, lo we lose basically the coherence of the motion of electrons, and so the also the uh, the concentration of the light with the plasma. So, and so uh, this uh, how to what we can ask to ourselves uh, how we can measure this defacing uh, of the plasmonic. Uh, uh, of the plasmas and uh, with for the particles, it's uh, it's it can be done uh, and specifically uh, in the last 20 years uh, uh, with the development also of uh, optical microscopy, so we can measure uh, the um, the scattering from single particles, and so we can uh, retrieve the uh, uh, optical absorption of our system. And so uh, from the uh, line width, for example, of uh, <laughs> from the line width. Of, uh, uh, of our spectra, so uh, we can retrieve the um, basically the uh, the lifetime of, uh, of the time of defacing of our, our, our plasma, and of course the, the these times uh, is uh, is composed by many different factors uh, from the uh, from the uh, electrolytization rate due to the Drude, Drude term or interband term, or from the radiation. Uh, as we were talking before, or from the surface uh, uh, electron uh, rate relaxation. Uh. Okay, this is uh, just to talk about uh, why, uh, what's the difference between optical excitation and intermittent interment transition. So, why the, these carriers are so hot, uh, so uh, have so high energy, and we can use that uh, in uh, our application. So, uh, of course, Usually in nodal metals, the D band uh, as uh, uh, say uh, is quite below the energy, uh, the Fermi energy, and so if we excite uh, through optical excitation and electrons, we will have uh, the creation of uh, electrons which has energy uh, uh, around the Fermi, uh, the Fermi level, while holes would be much more, uh, much more energetic. And so if we uh, if we need, for example, application where we need a, a high oxidation potential, so we can use maybe also interband transition. But electrons uh, are very, very uh, at very low energy, so we, we cannot activate uh, high, highly demanding uh, chemical process, for instance. Otherwise, uh, if we uh, excite the um, uh, the conducting electrons, which uh, belongs to the uh, um, which belong to the uh, sp band, usually, so uh, through interband transition, so. Uh, in the plasmonic uh, uh, index station of the plasma, so so we can create a uh, distribution of uh, hot electrons which has energy which goes much higher uh, of the Fermi uh, Fermi level, and so really we can use these uh, hot carriers, as they call, to uh, drive some uh, interesting process. OK, 
Okay, this is, uh, I want to introduce a few theoretical models which has been uh, reported uh, in the literature to determine, of course, it's important to uh, determine what is the uh, energy distribution of your electrons, so how much are close to the Fermi level, uh, the electrons or the O's, uh, and how this, is this distribution appears. So, of course, this is important to then design your the device for your specific application. And in this particular case, um, the group of Norlander uh, reported uh, this model <coughs> where they use a free electron uh, model basically without interbrand transition and uh, what they reported is uh, that the uh, energy di distribution of the electrons is symmetric of course uh, uh, respect with the Fermi energy uh, as we can see here and uh, if we uh, smaller particles create higher energetic electrons so we have the energy distribution uh, electrons with a higher energy uh, in the smaller particles and um, this is uh, because uh, with smaller particle basically uh, the uh, electron the, the phasing of the surface plasma can occur more, more efficiently and uh, you can <coughs> break the uh, conservation of linear momentum of the electrons mm -hmm. and so you can create more high uh, higher amount of energy um, of hot carriers so uh, this is also uh, we can see here uh, the generation efficiency of, of uh, energy electrons which is higher as I said for optimized for 10 nanometer particles then decrease for 15, 20 and 25 can I except yes so you put a tau is a, is a time there it's not a time constant uh, it's, li it's basically a lifetime of the plasma uh, uh, I think and uh, they um, they assume that the total dissipation of the plasma can occur in different Time scale. So there are calculations based on one material, one diameter, for different parameters. Tau. Yes. Okay. And yes, and uh, what they saw indeed, if you can prolong the the time of the, the of the excitation, you can <coughs> achieve much more hot electrons because right. you have much more events probably. Uh, and and uh, otherwise, if you go to more realistic maybe time, you you will have much more. Um, electrons which has uh, an energy close to uh, like uh, root electrons otherwise you, have, you will have much less hot carriers and this is probably the more realistic situation that there is uh, in the plasmonic materials this is another interesting models they in this these authors do did the next step in the, and uh, basically they also consider uh, interband uh, transition uh, coupling uh, the um, the transition of uh, optical transition with the uh, DFT models uh, uh, and uh, indeed uh, what they found the, uh, is that they found uh, interesting uh, interestingly they found that uh, most of the metals like they compare aluminium uh, silver uh, copper and uh, gold they found that the, the 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 hot carrier energy distribution is asymmetric so we can Depending on the density of states of the metals, therefore uh, we can create different energy distributions. This is, I guess, <coughs> my opinion is that, of course, because uh, this process is many body interactions, so it depends on the uh, occupation of, uh, of your density of states of the materials. And uh, um, so, as we can see here, we can comment on this. For example, we can see that aluminum uh, and silver has quite uh, symmetric distribution of carriers. Uh, and so electrons also have similar uh, energy distribution uh, and amount of electrons which are and holes which are generated. Otherwise, uh, copper and gold instead uh, as uh, hot as a hot electron which are not so uh, so energetic, so not so hot. Uh, uh, Why uh, they create very energetic holes, uh, as you can see from this asymmetric distribution. So this is tell us, for example, uh, if we think to, uh, to chemistry, then uh, uh, if we need to, uh, to drive <coughs> a reduction uh, a reaction, so uh, we would prefer, for example, to use these materials which, because they can generate more energetic electrons. Uh, otherwise, if we have to, to drive an oxidation, um, like, for example, the oxygen production from water splitting, so <laughs> maybe, uh, not maybe, but copper and silver uh, and gold can provide more uh, energetic carriers and so uh, they would be more suitable to, to do this kind of um, to, do, to, do, to drive this kind of reaction
Okay, this is another model from uh, our friends Sasha Govorov. And um, uh, again, here uh, we can see uh, again the, uh, the uh, an important point of this hot electron generation is that uh, when you excite, so the uh, the uh, plasma, you have really many electrons which has energy close to the Fermi level, and just a few of the electrons can, can have a higher energy uh, uh, and or holes. Uh, can have uh, a higher energy can be called uh, hot, let's say so, and then uh, that can be used for um, demanding application. Also, what is important uh, uh, in the uh, in the production of hot electrons is that, of course, this uh, hot electrons generation depends on the fields that you create in your nanostructure. So, the higher is the electric field that you create, the higher is the generation of hot electrons, uh, and um, and also. Uh, as we said before, uh, the size is important. So the smallest the size, the smallest uh, is the uh, the higher is the amount of uh, hot electrons that you can generate. And uh, regarding the the, the 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 shape, you can see here that by calculation, uh, here we can uh, we have the uh, field enhancement of the nanocrystals in different shapes. So a slab, uh, a small uh, sphere, or a cube. And you can see that uh, the uh, the electric field which is generated in the in the, the field enhancement which is generated in the cube is much higher than the sphere uh, because we have these vertices that uh, that are able to concentrate light much more efficiently and um, so in the, in the same similar uh, way so if we then calculate with uh, this uh, uh, this uh, theoretical model the number of hot electrons in these different shapes. Uh, we can see that the uh, this lab uh, creates much less uh, hot electrons than the spheres, and uh, then the sphere is outperformed by the the cube. So this is of course a, it's all important parameter uh, that has to take into account when we want to consider uh, practical uh, practical uh, applications. <coughs> This is another example, very similar, so I will skip. Uh, and then uh, I will just go to this two different uh, type of mechanism of hot electron injection when we consider a semiconductor. So, uh, of course, the, the problem with the hot electrons is related to the lifetime of these hot electrons. So, these hot electrons live very uh, femtoseconds, 120 seconds, 50, 20, 50 femtoseconds. Uh, and so, uh, how can we use these uh, hot electrons in real processes? So, for example, for catalysis, we have uh, uh, chemical reaction uh, time, average time around the order of milliseconds or uh, two seconds. And so, how can we can prolong the, the time of uh, of uh, lifetime of these electrons, for example? Uh, and uh, therefore, if we couple with the semiconductor with the metals, so we can of course separate the electrons uh, um, through, for example, a potential barrier. So indeed, if we couple a metal with a semiconductor, probably as we, you already know, we, uh, we, um, there is a formation of a Schottky barrier, so the potential barrier. And uh, therefore, if we excite our plasmas uh, into, the, uh, into the metals, uh, we have hot electrons we are, which are generated. And those electrons which has energy higher than the Schottky barrier can go through uh, the barrier and be injected in the, uh, in the mm -hmm. conduction band of the semiconductor. In this way, uh, this uh, mechanism is called indirect injection of, of electrons. And in this way, so we have electrons which are on one side on the semiconductor and hot holes which remain uh, on the metal's side. And of course, hot electrons cannot, cannot go back because there is a potential barrier which hinders the uh, back electron transfer reaction. Um, uh, on the other way, so uh, on the other side, we can also have another type of uh, mechanism, which was what I mentioned earlier, and um, this is quite a uh, new mechanism to, which has been observed by few people. And in this case, we have the creation, the excitation of surface plasmons in the metals, and uh, an instantaneous generation of charge density on the semiconductor and the creation of holes uh, in the metals. So basically, uh, in this mechanism, we have, uh, let's say, uh, is uh, indirect because we have to create hot electrons and also in the metals, and then these carriers has to uh, go uh, through the barrier and uh, be injected in the semiconductor. Otherwise, in this case, uh, we the electron density, so hot electrons are already generated inside the 
conduction bag of the uh, semiconductor or in the empty states, uh, unoccupied states of the molecules. And so basically, um, it has been shown that this, this process, for example, can be much more efficient than the uh, indirect uh, injection of hot electrons. Okay, this is an energetic schematics that yes. is always very partial in the story, no? So there is a band matching, and so you can have uh, indirect transitions. Yeah. Yeah. Where the conservation of momentum, I don't know where is. In the okay. And you can talk. Well, <laughs> let's talk here. So there is. Let, let's talk here because also it's a bit more complex, probably, than, than, than the indirect mechanism. Okay. So the, the indirect mechanism. Uh, so. Uh, uh, of course, these uh, semiconductor metal uh, hybrids are, uh, are called sh um, shock D diodes, for example, mm -hmm. and so uh, can be used for, to generate photocurrent in a photo detection scheme or uh, for, uh, for example, photoelectrons for water splitting. Uh, and um, so we can, uh, the using a simple uh, approach of the Fuller theory, we can uh, uh, calculate how much is the uh, photocurrent that we have in our system, or being uh, knowing the photocurrent we can retrieve how much is the barrier form in the metal, uh, between the metal and the semiconductor. Um, so this uh, was the, this is the original Fuller uh, uh, formula, and uh, this has been adapted for plasmonic uh, uh, devices, just by simply, you can simply uh, calculate uh, uh, the uh, plasmonic current simply by multiplying the uh, current uh, given by uh, the Fourier theory uh, by the times the absorption uh, of your plasmonic materials. And this has been already uh, shown to works for photodetection, for example, uh, or for photoelectrochemical water splitting. Another interesting model uh, to quantify or uh, to describe uh, the, um, the process, uh, uh, the efficiency of the process uh, of uh, uh, hot electron injection. So uh, is based uh, on the Spicer model of internal photoemissions. So the hot electron creation is basically internal photoemission of electrons. Uh, and uh, in this model, uh, the, uh, that can be applied to metal semiconductors, so it is uh, where we would let just three steps uh, to inject the electrons, or can be applied also in other types of, uh, of um, photodetector scheme, let's say like uh, metal, uh, <coughs> metal insulated metal uh, stack. So, uh, in these, uh, so in these models, basically, uh, we have the, uh, the first step, which is the um, creation of hot electrons. So we excite our plasmon and we create these hot electrons with high energy. Then these uh, hot electrons has to travel uh, towards the interface with the semiconductor, or in this case, to the, of the insulator. Uh, and um, they, for example, in this metal, uh, you consider only those uh, metals which survive and do, do not undergo elastic scattering uh, before reaching the uh, interface. Then uh, you can have, for example, there are an interface, so they can be reflected due to the impedance, matching between, uh, impedance mismatch between the two materials, or they, they, they can go through uh, the barrier. And then, of course, they can be collected to the other um, to the other metals to, to register the photocurrent. So to really uh, model this hot electron injection mechanism or photocurrent in a more specific way, uh, we can really use these um, steps of these models and, uh, and um, consider many physical variables to arrive of, uh, of, 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 of to nice uh, modeling and understanding of the, of the process. But are you going to consider tunneling as well? Uh, no, in this case, tunneling is not uh, is not considered. Let's say, but of course, in this mo in this in this in this uh, mechanism can be tunnel tunneling as well. So, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, height of the barrier is not is not really this uh, given by this formula because the actually the height, for example, of the Schottky barrier can really depends on many different factors like uh, inhomogeneity of the interface, uh, the stoichiometry, um, also uh, really the uh, electronics, uh, the electronic uh, properties of the interface can depend on the size, for example, of the, uh, of the, the particles that you're considering. So, for example, if you consider uh, thin films, 
uh, these snippings will create different Schottky barrier uh, than those created when you consider, for example, nanoparticles deposited on, on nanowires. And this has been demonstrated that uh, really, uh, for example, the contact surface area between the materials can create different Schottky barriers and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, another, another, another thing to consider can be the tunneling because the electrons can also tunnel here probably uh, and so uh, this is just really the, 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 the simplest picture of what is, is happening when you will consider the electrons traveling from one material to the others. Okay, this is uh, the debated uh, direct injection mechanism. Uh, and uh, um, so this is, was first, uh, was first um, uh, proposed by the Presdo, which uh, simulated actually with pressure pressure theory, uh, uh, a slab of titanium oxide uh, with a gold cluster. Uh, and uh, they saw that after uh, the um, optical excitation, there was a, the localization of the plasma directly into the uh, titanium oxide. Uh, and uh, this was confirmed experimentally uh, uh, when uh, through mm, ultra-fast pump spectroscopy, uh, where they see the creation of these states in uh, um, gold cadmium uh, selenide nanorods. Uh, and they calculated the quantum efficiency of 24% uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this process. And similar, uh, so a similar uh, things, uh, or different way to say this, uh, is uh, when you consider the uh, molecules which are absorbed on the surface of, uh, of your metals. And so, uh, as we uh, can see here, basically, uh, when we have molecules, uh, can happen, let's say, similar things what, of what we uh, have been described for solids, uh, for semiconductor. So in the case of molecules, so you can have a molecule which, um, which uh, has uh, the uh, occupied states and the uh, unoccupied states, and so we have the creation of hot electrons, so the decay of the plasma, and the, uh, the hot electrons can be injected uh, in unoccupied states and form uh, the uh, transit negative <coughs> ions, so this uh, high energy um, uh, form of a specific molecules. For example, oxygen uh, can be uh, can uh, be uh, interact with the plasma, and we can create the oxygen minus radical, which can then can be uh, activate some specific uh, uh, chemical reaction. But uh, what has been also observed is that. Uh, uh, you can uh, at some point have molecules uh, which uh, as which form an interface state. Uh, uh, so the interaction of the interface between the plasmonic materials and the uh, molecules form a new uh, a new hybrid states, uh, and these states can be occupied by by this interface damping to the uh, to, uh, of the plasma. So uh, there is no creation of hot electrons, but these uh, electrons, which belongs to the, uh, to the plasmonic oscillation, so can directly be uh, scattered into the uh, into the empty state of the interfacial state in the interfacial state created by the, between the molecules and the and the metals. And this, is co of course, is interesting. Uh, let's say much more than this, maybe from a, a catalysis point of view, because uh, maybe uh, it would be possible maybe to design specific. Uh, interfacial state between the molecules uh, and uh, and the metals, and so uh, you can activate uh, at will uh, a different reaction pathway uh, by engineering the hybridization of the uh, of the electronic state the, uh, between the molecule itself and the plasmonic materials. Okay, this was uh, was the uh, let's say the first part where I I, I introduced a bit uh, the, uh, the phasing of the plasmons and the creation of electrons uh, inside materials and also different types of uh, uh, mechanism uh, into semiconductor and uh, into molecules uh, and uh, then uh, I will and then I will I want to just give uh, an overview of uh, the application where we can use these uh, hot carriers and uh, uh, I will start with uh, photo detection. So, uh, as you know, the photo, de photo detection are really ubiquitous in, uh, in our life and in our lab. Uh, so, uh, and usually we, uh, we, of course, we use a semiconductor 
uh, uh, for example, PN junction. So we we uh, illuminate the our photodetector. We, we uh, are and this uh, we create electron and hole pairs, and these electron and hole pairs are separated. So we can we can read the current, for example. But uh, so the problem, of course, with the, uh, by using semiconductor is that. Uh, we can detect light which uh, is associated uh, to a specific uh, wavelength range, which is, of course, the, the um, wavelength range associated with the band gap of the semiconductor. So, uh, we in, which means that uh, we will have a sensitivity to a specific range of wavelength. Uh, for example, with the silicon, we can, uh, we can have this uh, range of wavelength where we are sensitive. Or if we want to go more in the near area, we can use germanium and so on and so forth. So, a particular semiconductor can be used only for a limited uh, wavelength range. And uh, uh, so, what the plasmonic community uh, start to uh, sell, let's say, uh, ten years ago was so, okay. With the plasma, we can really uh, just use more materials, and uh, we can uh, basically tailor the size and the shape. Here, we can really be sensitive to. Uh, every uh, wavelength that we want. So we can create broadband photodetection, for example, just by using one single material. So, of course, it's convenient uh, when you want to process some specific device. And uh, so here uh, was the uh, one of the first, not the first, but one of the first report uh, to report this concept of the, uh, using uh, plasmonic and antennas. In this case, in this, uh, this, ca um, this uh, uh, example was gold. Uh, uh, that was the poison of silicon substrate, and so uh, the, of course the gold and the silicon form Schottky junction. And again, it's the same uh, mechanism that we explained uh, just earlier. So we have the uh, excitation of hot electrons, and these hot electrons can be separated by the uh, potential barrier form and the interface between the metal and the semiconductor. And uh, as we can see, uh, indeed, uh, what they uh, they, uh, they did was to prepare different uh, resonator with a different size, uh, as we can see here, uh, and uh, measure the, uh, the photocurrent generated by the illumination uh, uh, at different wavelengths. And you can see here uh, the responsibility, responsibility, responsibility of a different device uh, having different size of nanostructures. And as we can see here, the photocurrent spectra that the register was following the uh, localized surface plasma resonance of this nanostructure, so demonstrating that uh, this current was coming from the hot electrons, um, um, uh, coming from the deactivation of the plasma itself. This uh, was a follow up study uh, where uh, they basically used similar, uh, a similar uh, device, uh, a similar. Um, uh, design, uh, but uh, in this case they compare to different uh, uh, morphology. Let's say so. In the, in the first one, they had basically uh, uh, gold uh, with <coughs> the, uh, with the silicon, uh, just basically deposited on top of silicon. And in the second case, uh, they embedded the uh, the, the gold uh, stripes uh, into the silicon. Uh, so in this <coughs> in this way, what they did basically is uh, was to have a much higher contact surface between the metals and the semiconductor. And so uh, basically, hot electrons could escape uh, through uh, in three directions, so three dimensions, uh, uh, instead of having just the injection of hot electrons in one direction. Uh, and uh, they show basically that uh, the, uh, the response of the photocurrent was announced in the case uh, of uh, really embedding the, the structure inside uh, the, the semiconductor. Okay, this is a, this was this is another example. The the the, um, the, uh, the idea is always the same. So then you can start playing this uh, this uh, game uh, however you want. So you can create, uh, for example, stripes, or you can create uh, if you want uh, like a detect photo detection with uh, which depends on polarization, or you can create uh, different uh, sh shape like uh, uh, nano squares. And in this case, you will have unpolarized photo responsibility. And of course, you can create this uh, any kind of uh, nanostructure. Uh, you can have a photo detection a single a specific wavelength, or you can create uh, broadband photo detection in a very wide range of uh, wavelength, depending on what you want to uh, design. 
this is another example that's in this uh, in this uh, case we change the material so here we have always always uh, always gold and silicon as a semiconductor in this case instead they use um, basically graphene uh, uh, on top of a metal surfaces uh, done by snowflakes to and this basically snowflakes uh, uh, these snowflakes uh, metal atoms, let's say metal cell, enable the, uh, the broadband absorption of light. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the, the, the simulation and experimental detection of electric field uh, generated by these snowflakes. And, uh, uh, okay, this is just to finish, it's just to show that you can really create many different fancy nanostructure. Why this Why this? <laughs> because you can create many different fancy <laughs> structures, <laughs> and uh, of course, you know this is okay. Was creating uh, well. The, the, the I think the, 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 the one of the reason was to have like um, as uh, like uh, to be insensitive to polarization, so to have some kind of uh, isotropic structure. Uh, and uh, um, other than that, I think you can create this with many different shapes. And so uh, in this. In this case, they sell these like fractal-like metal surfaces, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, but you know, it just again to the point is you can really create whatever shape maybe. Yeah, because uh, if you make a disc, you are polarization. Exactly. <laughs> but that's not fancy enough. But it's not a snowflake <laughs> and fractal and whatever. <laughs> And so, you know, uh, also this is important to sell somewhere. <laughs> the is it that shape associated to a kind of phase transition? Is this shape associated to a kind of phase transition? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think it could be. Ah, we can imagine. I think it could be. Uh, you know, uh, this is, as I can see, it's a kind of fractal. Fractals are well associated to phase transitions. Kind of when, when you have this percolation with the particles. So, so you, you probably can't agree with that. Maybe, so I don't know. I think these are all connected, and anyhow, it's like a gold structure which has very nice uh, shape and very nice uh, field enhancement, and of course, broadband uh, absorption. So, uh, also, this, in this case, the, the, the things also here was like <coughs> they used the graphene as a, uh, collectors, and so there was much different than the case of silicon and um, and uh, another semiconductor um, I think I think is more related with the fractal nature is it matters or no I don't know <laughs> I have to say that I don't know but I I, I, I don't think it's really matter in this case because it's not I mean it's not, um, it's not complex made three dimension complex made where we are going to see how the lights propagate, etc. So uh, it's a 2D mm, surface where we have this shape. And so uh, maybe uh, we can ask to, I don't know, we can go through more through this. So okay, then uh, now I just, just this was just a glimpse into what uh, we can do with uh, uh, hot electrons in photodetection. And uh, then uh, uh, I want to skip to more my uh, let's say applications, uh, uh, which is like uh, related to catalysis and water splitting, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, before you, yes. Before you change the topic, yes. Um, what happened with these uh, proposals? They were like very, like they were very good in the, in that time, but are they going to apply it in real applications? Plasma photodetectors? Yeah. What you just talked about? No, no, it's not for the previous. Those in ones. general. Yeah. I don't know if it would become really uh, some kind of some. Or oh, there need like difficulties or uh, problems. So the problem is that the efficiency of this uh, hot electrons generation collection is very low. Oh, okay. It's very, so it's cool because okay, it's very nice because you you can have really uh, insensitive uh, some power. Yeah, because I mean it was a comment before because we tried the experiment it doesn't work very well. All is based on energetics. Mm. Well, you have to match band structure, you have to conserve the K, etc. So this is not considered anywhere here. So basically <coughs> the efficiency with which you, you can transfer the electron which is hot into the material is not just the energy or overcoming a barrier. You have to match the K vector too. And so most of these electrons are bounced back, they don't go there. 
It's like in, in mag magnetic tunnel junctions, uh, the efficiency of, of the effect is when you have a perfect, uh, you consider also the, the band structure connection, and it's not just having an insulator in the middle. Here is basically the same. So that part is missing. Totally mm -hmm. missing. Okay. Is there is exactly, and so this is also in my in my also following this. I think is more promising for catalysis, for example, yeah. where we have small nano structure and this momentum <coughs> is anyhow released somehow these uh, these constraints. But in this case, we are always talking about hundreds of nanometers nano structure where this restriction of physics uh, is really strong and it's released. Yeah. And, and, and indeed, here the photoresponsivity is like very small. I mean. So maybe with different materials, coupling, I don't know, with new different nonlinear effects, we can uh, enhance this uh, photodetection or injection. But so far, it's just a fundamental uh, way how we can use the photoelectrodes with uh, injected from the surface plasma. And I think it's more interesting. So this is uh, for catalysis, as I was saying, to me, uh, they are more, much more interesting, uh, and so I, I'm going to talk about two things in catalysis: photoelectrochemical water splitting, which is more similar to the uh, case of the photodetection, because we always here we are again speaking about shocky diodes, and so I think also for this is not really something promising from uh, if we want to talk about practical point of view, but uh, instead for the uh, catal catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis is much more interesting because really we can do something which is different than what we do with the uh, heat and uh, what we do with uh, another way of uh, catalysis so uh, and uh, so again indeed what is splitting the basic uh, the the use of hot electrons in this application is really the same for the detection basically uh, because we have a semiconductor in the, the water splitting which is in contact with electrolyte we have band bending and so the creation of depletion layer so when we shine the light with the with the uh, on the semiconductor we create electron and holes uh, in the semiconductor, which has very energetic, they, they separate and then we can drive uh, with with this uh, uh, photon energy, let's say, uh, some specific chemical reactions. In this case, uh, again, the problem is that we usually uh, very nice and stable materials uh, have very big big band gap, like 3.2 3 electron volts. And of course, uh, if you think to uh, the solar spectrum, this means that we can use like four or five percent of the solar spectrum. So uh, this is not really enough if, if we want to um, create some solar fuels in an efficient way. We should go at least at 10 or 15 percent of uh, conversion. Uh, uh, so of conversion. So and here we, can, we are saying that just four or five percent is absorbed. So then we have all the losses associated to uh, interfaces, uh, chemical reaction, and so on and so forth. But so what we can do here in photoelectrochemical water splitting is what basically the same uh, photo detection. We can couple uh, uh, a nanoparticle of metals, uh, and so we can harvest visible light, for example, which is not absorbed by our semiconductor. And then we can inject the hot electrons um, uh, from the plasmonic materials into the semiconductor. So, for example, if titanium oxide or zinc oxide has a, a photocurrent generating which is up to 400 nanometer, then we can register a photocurrent in, in the, uh, which is also in the visible, like 500 or 600 nanometers. So we can start to collect those photons which are usually not absorbed by the semiconductor. And this, uh, of course, is not a really efficient uh, process, again, uh, because uh, uh, we have to, um, to uh, basically, we have to excite the surface plasmas. This plasma should decay in hot electrons. And then this hot electron should be injected in the semiconductor. And the other, uh, and the holes, for example, so the other, uh, let's say, uh, charge which remain on the metals, should react with the molecules. So uh, should have enough energy to, to drive a chemical reaction. And this will give you the photocorrent. Otherwise, uh, you will not get the photocorrent. And uh, uh, indeed, OK, this is the IPC, but I don't trust this very much. Uh, but usually, uh, you can get efficiency of photocurrent uh, in the visible or near IR, so where the semiconductor does not absorb, which is in the range usually 1 2%, or okay, here 6%, 7%, um, which I never saw actually in my experiments. But, <laughs> uh, but, but okay, this we're talking about that um, very low photocurrent because it 
semiconductor, for example, inside the band gap can be even produce 80% or 90% of IPC, so of conversion of electrons into useful carriers uh, to drive the chemical reaction. So th this is really, uh, again, 1% uh, again or 2% of what we uh, add to the, to the total uh, efficiency. Uh, it's not really enough. So of course with plasmon, we can play many different um, games. And so we can have single particles. Uh, uh, we can have uh, particles with one size, which absorb, say, gold at 530 nanometers. So we can enhance the photocurrent to one specific region. Or we can couple uh, nano rods. Uh, okay, we can do like different shapes or anisotropic antennas. And so we can have different resonance, one longitude, another one transversal. So we can uh, we can have the uh, collection of hot electrons in the semiconductor mm -hmm. due to the different resonance that we excite in the antenna. And uh, again, we can put many different particles with different size, and so we can cover, let's say, from a absorption point of view, all the uh, visible spectrum, and uh, uh, this uh, would uh, be reflecting the uh, uh, sensitization of the photocurrent that we generate also in the visible spectrum. And here, there is just different example of, uh, of what you can do uh, with this, this hot electron injection in the semiconductor. And uh, of course, you can study materials, as we did uh, recently. So, uh, as I, I showed in my lecture, so uh, we use titanium nitride instead of gold. In this case, we show that titanium nitride is more efficient than gold. And this is really so you can use really different material gold, silver, titanium nitride, maybe also TCO, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, the, the choice of the materials uh, that you use, of course, depends on the stability of the materials in chemical conditions and the. Uh, um, the uh, let's say the <coughs> the the, the um, uh, characteristic of your materials, the, the junction that is being formed between the semiconductor and the metals, and so on and so forth. And uh, this is just the last example of this kind of structure, which was interesting because basically in this case they didn't use a shock uh, junction to uh, to enhance the photocurrent coming from the semiconductor, but in this case they produce a device uh, where the uh, carriers were, were coming all from the, dis or from the defacing of the surface plasmons. Uh, uh, and so basically they use uh, uh, an array of gold nanostructures uh, and uh, they deposit on top of that amorphous titanium oxide uh, uh, and uh, 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 platinum as a catalyst for hydrogen. Uh, while on the on the um, on the lateral side, so a different location, they deposit the catalyst for oxygen evolution. So when they shine the light uh, with light, which was not uh, basically uh, exciting the titanium oxide, uh, they saw the generation of oxygen and uh, hydrogen from water splitting. So uh, all the carriers ca was coming from the uh, from the surface plasma of the gold. So um, the mechanism in this case is a bit complicated, but Basically, you have the formation of hot electrons and holes in the gold, and then electrons uh, are, are being injected in the, uh, or filtered, as they say, by titanium oxide. Basically, they use this amorphous titanium oxide just to separate the carriers. And then these electrons went to the, are coll were collected into the platinum nanoparticles, and here hydrogen could be evolved. Otherwise, uh, on the different location, the holes travels to, towards the oxygen catalyst and which uh, facilitated the production of oxygen. And uh, this was interesting because they demonstrated this uh, for photoanodes, for, for generation of oxygen, for uh, hydrogen production, or uh, just uh, by putting uh, a metal, uh, a, a, a films uh, where they have this nanostructure in water and they saw basically unbiased generation of hydrogen and oxygen. So depending on uh, how you design uh, the structure, so if you put the catalyst or not, if you put the platinum or not, you can create, uh, they could create uh, different devices which alternatively can be used for hydrogen, oxygen evolution, or both the overall water splitting without applying any bias, so without providing any energy uh, but the solar light. This is, a, is another example where they use uh, a similar concept for CO2 reduction in this case, so Maybe as you, as you know also, besides water splitting, also carbon dioxide reduction is a very hot topic. So 
what we want to do is reduce carbon dioxide catch from the atmosphere and create some uh, hydrocarbons to be used as fuels basically or methanol so some chemicals uh, commodity chemicals that can be used from our society uh, and uh, of course without using the uh, fossil fuels uh, to be produced and so in this case they did basically uh, they use the same concept uh, device uh, where they have they had in this case a pitap semiconductor gallium nitride and this was coupled to gold nanoparticles this was done by the Outwater group uh, three years ago and uh, basically also in this case you have the excitation of a surface plasma in the gold decaying hot electrons and ores and in this case the uh, the ores uh, were injected into the mm -hmm. uh, in the to the ballast band uh, while hot electrons were used to directly uh, reduce CO2 uh, to, uh, to CO, for example, different, uh, different uh, products. And in this case, so uh, it was used what they did, basically they simulate. So they use uh, gold, which produce very energetic holes, uh, and so they can be efficiently injected into the bias band. Uh, so this was an interesting uh, example how to use uh, same materials, but in different uh, device concept and also by using what the, <coughs> the, the theory predicted uh, uh, as far as uh, um, energy distribution wise for hot electrons and hot holes. But he induce, how you induce holes in the balance band if it is full? Because, uh, well, actually uh, they apply a bias. Right. So they apply the bias into the device so they were able to draw away the, the excess of charge into the dial. <coughs> I need some food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is what I think just to the last part in, instead would, would be devoted to heterogeneous catalysis. And okay, I will try to be maybe a bit quicker. Eh? And mm? Mm. Mm. <laughs> so this, I think, is one of the most important um, or promising fields for hot electrons or hot carriers in general, so which is catalysis, because, um, as you know, uh, all the 90% um, of chemical processes relies on heterogeneous catalysis, so the polymer formation, uh, ref uh, reforming uh, of natural gases, hydrogen production, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, all the chemicals that are used, for example, to produce ammonia, which is of course important for uh, as a fertilizer, so for our food is like crucial, uh, and, and or hydrogen, which is very important for many different uh, um, uh, industries. So all relies on thermal processes. So uh, as I said, 52% of the, the of the energy that we produce are put in. Uh, into uh, the chemical, into the industry in general, to uh, heating and cooling, and uh, a big, uh, a big piece of pie is given to heterogeneous catalysis, uh, and of course, uh, so uh, uh, for mm, driving the reaction uh, in a thermal way, you use a, uh, a catalyst, so we can decrease the energy which is needed to drive a uh, chemical reaction, uh, acting to the decreasing of the activation barrier of a uh, transition state between the reactants and, uh, and the products. And uh, so, uh, of course, thermal energy is not very efficient to do that because we just need to provide more and more energy until, uh, until we, uh, we reach a point in where the uh, electrons, maybe we can, can interact with the molecules, can activate a specific uh, uh, intermediate state in the reaction, and then we can arrive to the products. And, and this is not, of course, efficient because uh, we need to provide really a lot of energy uh, into the system. And so, uh, seven years ago, there was the uh, first demonstration of hot carriers in catalysis. And was, uh, this was particularly important because it was tested not in the model reaction, but uh, in the uh, partial oxidation of ethylene to, <coughs> to ethylene oxide, which is, as I reported here, yeah, 20 billion industry to, uh, in 2008. Uh, and so, what they show is that uh, if they uh, use plasmonic particles, uh, silver particles deposit on an inert uh, support, and they shine the light on these particles, 
uh, so they, they, they could drive more efficiently the reaction uh, if compared to thermal reaction, as you can see here. So we have thermal reaction efficiency at different temperatures, so <coughs> at the rate enhancement of the reaction. And uh, if we use light, so uh, this was the, uh, the uh, rate enhancement. So we can really drive more efficiently uh, the, the, the reaction. Uh, as you can notice here, there is a photothermal <coughs> effect. So we can, if we shine the light on this catalyst, we produce uh, both the creation of hot electrons and holes, uh, but also uh, the increase of temperature. And this is, was a bit, this is a bit still uh, something which is open to the literature and that is not be really uh, considered very much uh, as a problem. Uh, uh, I, I think that many reported that hot electrons are really activate process in uh, a more efficient way, but also many didn't uh, consider the real temperature that they generated the surface of this particle. And so, of course, if you claim that you're doing this at room temperature and instead you have locally 300 degrees, then everything's changed. So maybe. Uh, so this is really a point which should be clarified in the literature. And uh, here, uh, just to simplify and to shorten this, basically the uh, oxidation of this uh, ethylene uh, go through the activation of oxygen, which then attacks, attack these carbon bonds and create the ep epoxide. And so the, the, the rate determinant step for this uh, attack of oxygen is the creation of uh, 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 this state so the trans transit negative ions of oxygen to minus, and uh, with hot electrons this can be do uh, can be done more efficiently. So basically, uh, they they saw uh, they demonstrated that this was what uh, hot electrons were doing, and this is all is very intuitive because if you have more electrons on the surface of the catalyst, you will have, you will have more electron density, which can react uh, with your molecules, and so the, the interaction can be more favorable. This is another example. Uh, again, uh, they also demonstrate this for um, for many different reactions, like oxidation of ammonia and so on and so forth. And um, also, uh, they what they observed was interesting because uh, uh, for this kind of reaction is that uh, when you think to photocatalysis with semiconductor, for example, you shine a photon in your semiconductor, you excite an electron and holes, and then this can drive. Uh, the reaction with your uh, uh, reactants. And so you have a kind of uh, generation of one electron per photon, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some materials maybe that can uh, do this more efficiently and also produce more, more electrons. Uh, but uh, let's say for, for the metals, if you use plasma, this, uh, this restriction can be released, for example, because for every photon that, that you shine on your metals, uh, then you have multiple electrons which are excited. And so uh, they can, uh, you can create much more what hot electrons than one uh, per photon that you, that you put on the system. And so this is can be um, interesting for catalysis because you can have much more electrons which react with your molecules. So you can create more products and the, so the, the efficiency of the system becomes much, much more higher. And, and, and so this is uh, just to say that what they observe is that increasing the intensity of light they saw indeed <coughs> a really uh, a, a, a different dependence uh, of the uh, production rate of the products uh, uh, as a function of the intensity. Uh, um, and, and this was uh, attributed to the, uh, to the switch from a single electron driven uh, mechanism to a multi-electronic driven mechanism. So this is also famous. Uh, this is a famous. Uh, <coughs> I want to talk about this because this is a famous uh, articles which also really uh, brought a lot of interest in this um, in this field. But uh, maybe I can say here I don't believe much in this. And it's like uh, what they reported is that they were able with hot electrons to uh, to induce the dissociation of hydrogen, uh, which is very stable molecules and. Uh, uh, again, uh, by uh, populating basically the antibonic orbitals uh, of the uh, hydrogen, uh, they claim to uh, to <coughs> be able uh, to uh, also destroy these very stable molecules. Mm -hmm. um, but the, here, I, I think also this is one of those examples that, uh, as I was speaking before, this really there is a problem of temperature. Maybe um, there was not a careful consideration of the temperature reach the surface of crystals and. So uh, this can be very, very tricky. So 
This is another example again of hot electrons generation and uh, uh, for certain reductions in this case. Again, uh, it was interesting because, for example, pseudo reduction is very um, difficult reaction, and what uh, you, you you can mm, arrive to many different reaction problems. So you can have methanol, methane, formate. So the problem is that all these reduction problems have very similar uh, energy, and so it's not uh, easy to have selective reaction to a specific uh, problem. And uh, in this case, uh, the author uh, use uh, rhodium nanocubes. Uh, not very efficient plasmonic materials, but they use these materials uh, to uh, drive the CO2 reduction. And basically, uh, changing uh, by, uh, from, the from the thermal uh, uh, regime to a photocatalytic regime with the plasma, they were able to switch the selectivity to increase the selectivity to methane or alternative to CO, depending on the condition uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the illumination. So, Uh, so this is uh, another example. So the, all these material, all these example, as we I spoke, it was based on uh, plasmonic uh, nanocrystals. Uh, and uh, um, what has been introduced later, uh, you know, is was uh, it was this um, this concept of the plasmonic reactor antenna uh, antenna reactor system. Basically, uh, the plasmonic materials usually are not very good catalysts. So silver, uh, gold, aluminium, they are very very bad lossy loss catalyst, uh, but they are very good in absorbing light. Uh, and otherwise, uh, uh, metals like uh, uh, rhodium, palladium, uh, all these three, uh, three D traditional metals are very good catalysts. Platinum, but they are very lossy, divisible, and so they are not very good for creating uh, resonating structures. So if you can couple these two properties into an hybrid structure, then you can absorb very efficiently the light. And uh, you can uh, use uh, otherwise these particles of palladium or platinum uh, to drive plasmonic catalysis. So in particular, so if you put very close these uh, lossy uh, metals to uh, uh, a um, plasmonic antenna, so the plasma can decay directly on the lossy uh, on the lossy metals, and so you can have directly generate hot electrons uh, into your catalytic materials. So you uh, you have the light absorbed on the uh, your good uh, metals, let's say the plasmonic metal, and then uh, the plasma decay on the good catalytic metal. So, so you can uh, basically uh, use the good properties of one materials and the other and create a, a very nice and structure. And so also in this case, what, for example, here is the aluminum nanocrystal with the palladium uh, particles, which were used uh, for, uh, for uh, the uh, ethylene uh, reduction again they show very nice performance uh, also here uh, we can see another example of a palladium particle deposited on uh, on the on the tips of golden rods and also here they use this concept so basically uh, the majority of light was absorbed by the gold and then the hot electrons produced uh, were produced on the palladium particles that can drive for example Suzaki coupling so the formation of carbon carbon bots bond more efficiently uh, at, at lower temperature than the usual heterogeneous catalysis mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So you can really use this process of materials to uh, release the um, energy uh, which is needed to drive a chemical reaction. And then of course uh, if you introduce multiple components into your system you have to design how the, your plasma decay on the, uh, on, on the catalytic metals. Here are some example. Uh, where they show, for example, that if you have like a, a silver antenna and platinum uh, catalytic materials, you can tune how efficiently is coupled the plasma to, to the uh, from the silver to the platinum by changing the spacing between these two materials, and so on and so forth. And finally, this is a final example, for example, where they had a nice, uh, clever idea. So instead of putting just particles, they just cover with a thin shell all the uh, all the antenna so they can have the, the dissipation the, the formation of the carriers on the layers of the platinum but also uh, not only in one location but all over the surface of the cubes and so in this way they can uh, <coughs> harvest much more of electrons and uh, have much more efficiency uh, in, uh, in the catalysis this is a, was last slide so uh, just to finish 
Uh, again, in my case, the uh, surface plasma defacing and dissipation is something that we can have again, so we can use for driving many, many different uh, uh, applications or processes. Uh, and um, in particular, uh, hot electrons uh, and energy distribution really depends on materials, so this is something that we should take into account when we want to design a specific uh, system for a specific application. So as we, as we saw, uh, gold and copper can produce much, uh, much more energetic host than electrons with respect to aluminum uh, and, um, uh, aluminum, uh, and silver, uh, which they can produce more, as a, more symmetric and, and more energetic of electron instead. So depending on what we need, we can use uh, different materials. And uh, then uh, I show how we can use the hot electrons for photo detection or also for photoelectrochemical with splitting in diodes. Again, here we saw that this process is not very efficient, but uh, uh, maybe we can increase the efficiency and the interest in this kind of in kind of devices by studying uh, the physical details of uh, of different mechanism of, of injection. And finally, uh, again, the uh, possibility to use a hot electron to drive sustainable chemistry, which is my field, so this is very interesting. And uh, it's very important for uh, our future, how to we can really create uh, uh, clean fuels uh, in a more efficient way, a sustainable way, without uh, using too much energy. So I think this is just, uh, this is just the last slide. So thank you, and I will continue tomorrow with, uh, with the uh, thermoplasmonic uh, section. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, you want? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm wondering because uh, catalyst is just uh, everything is about time and rate of reaction, right? What happens with uh, those kind of material? Because we are talking about high speed, high fields, high temperatures, you know, high spots. Is there like a loss of material throughout time or? On the catalyst? Yeah, the catalyst itself. Well, the catalyst, for example, of course, is, is very important. So we should uh, create some stable materials. And uh, uh, for example, uh, many of these students use <coughs> silver and gold, uh, but which I don't like, as I showed my slides. Uh, because anyhow, silver and gold have always problems. Silver can oxidize very easily. So you have different optical properties and different reactivity and gold as well. So this, of course, is very important. So when we want to design the catalyst, it should be stable depending on if the reaction is in liquid or gas, or, or gas space, what temperature you want to drive the reaction, and so on and so forth. So it's like, it's like an additional restriction to the system? Is additional? Like a restriction additional to the system? The, the, yeah, this I think should be the first one to think about. So the stability of what you're creating and uh, uh, so then you can select your material to, to do what to do and then study how to tune your physical properties to have the best efficiency. Okay, and um, you? Uh, I'm trying to understand, do you use semiconductor for different processes like, you know, for different aesthetics, uh, distribution and efficiency of thermal, what is it, hot carriers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's actually possible you see in your tier materials besides the technical problems like semiconductors or you do like superconductors or it's only for semiconductors? Um, I don't know, I think it's for semiconductors. In this case, uh, uh, it's a different process, I, I guess, it's physical. Any <laughs> <laughs> more questions? Lunch. <laughs> 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 uh, we can. <laughs>